Our next speaker is not only a pivotal figure in the conservative movement, he is also a much bigger Star Wars fan than probably anybody else in this room. So if you have any questions about Star Wars, ask those after his session. So Jedi Master Patrick Coyle is the Vice President of Young America's Foundation. He is co-editor with Foundation President Ron Robinson, who you guys heard from yesterday, of the Conservative Guide to Campus Activism and wrote Campus Conservative Battle Plan, both published by the Foundation. His success has not escaped notice from the dark side, otherwise known as the left, um, as a radical leftist website once published his home address and phone number in an attempt to halt his conservative activism. However, it didn't work. As we know, um, strike him down and he will become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. Patrick Coyle is also responsible for overseeing student programs, including the creation of new activism initiatives and materials, including the 9-11 Never Forget Project, No More Che Day, and Freedom Week, all of which you all should get involved in when you get back to your campuses. He serves as the Executive Director of Young Americans for Freedom, a project of Young America's Foundation, and he's also Chairman of the Board for the Young Americans for Freedom Foundation. Patrick Coyle joined the Rebel Alliance at Penn State, where he joined the campus's Young Americans for Freedom chapter during college and eventually became chairman of the chapter. His activism was even covered on the Rush Limbaugh show. During his years at Penn State, he brought numerous speakers to campus through GAF's robust campus lecture program. Patrick Coyle has been quoted in numerous publications such as Time Magazine, The Washington Times, Washington Post, The Los Angeles Times, The Atlanta Atlanta Journal-Constitution, and his speeches have been covered by C-SPAN. Please help me welcome Jedi Master Patrick Coyle. (laughs) Thank you, Padawan Lutz. Um, What I'm going to really focus on is how you can take these ideas and how you can present them um, on your high school or on your college campuses. And what are the strategies and approaches that you can use to be a successful conservative activist if you choose to do so, and I hope you do. Um, And before I go any further, I think it's first important to kind of define, when we talk about a successful activist, what do you mean by that? How do you define um, a successful activist? Well, I think there are about you know, three basic qualities in my mind that help define a successful activist. Uh, first of all, some will say that a successful activist uh, is basically focused on just how often is that student out on their high school campus actually like doing things? Are they involved with a club? You know, do they bring in speakers? Do they you know, blog? Do they tweet? Do, what, you know, do they have events that they set up? How much activity is this person involved with? And that's partially true. However, I think there's a second component to to being a successful activist that's important, and that is also knowing the ideas behind the activism. Obviously, we believe that's very important. That's why we have programs like this one, to help you learn more about conservative ideas. However, I think there's a third component to defining a successful activist, and that is what is their activist mentality. In other words, what are the approaches, uh, what are the strategies does that student use to present their ideas on campus? So, for example, you can have something as simple as a so-called recruitment table out on your high school campus during lunch hours or you know, before a football game or whatever it is at your school. But if the issues that you are focusing on don't resonate with other students or if the materials that you have on that table sort of turn people off, you just won't be um, as um, effective as you may want to be. Now, before I get into strategy, though, I think I would be remiss if I didn't first touch on uh, the reaction you'll probably receive um, if you choose to speak out. And I know some of you have already done so and have faced some obstacles for sure. But unfortunately, over the last school year, uh, we, have se- we have seen at Young America's Foundation increase attacks against free expression on college campuses. Uh, for example, um, since the presidential election this year, Um, 46% of our campus lectures um, have been protested or, you know, some administrator will throw up some roadblocks like asking for a certificate of insurance or blocking the public uh, from attending uh, the event. Um, That compares to prior to the election when only 15% of our campus lectures faced the same obstacle. So basically, since the election, since, you know, President Trump Uh, One, the left has come completely unhinged, basically. And to get more specific, you know, in the past, you know, the left would do all they can, that they could to really um, 
stifle conservative ideas. And you may have heard some of these horror stories in the past that have occurred. Like, for example, in the past, you would see leftists resorting to, like, burning Bibles um, outside of lecture halls featuring conservative speakers. Um, you would also see um, speakers like Derek Green and other black conservatives, when they've appeared on campus, you would have leftists, you know, shouting racial slurs at them. Uh, and sometimes even, you know, instead of, you know, res God forbid, you know, challenging conservative speakers with, like, thought-provoking questions, we basically see students, or leftist students, resorting to violence, uh, trying to assault conservatives, um, or even throwing salad dressing on them, and so on, which is what has happened in the past. Um, you may have heard the stories um, in high schools where a high school teacher lost a bet for um, hoping that uh, President Trump would be assassinated before the inauguration or during the inauguration. There were instances during the Obama administration where an, a high school teacher threatened a student with arrest for merely being critical um, of Barack Obama's policies. And right off the road here at UC Santa Barbara, we had a, an incident where we had two high school students who went onto that campus into the so-called free speech zone, and they wanted to talk about their pro-life values. And these pro-life values really offended this one professor on campus, and she ended up assaulting these students and stole their, their signs from them. Um, now, you would think that, you know, the university would actually denounce uh, the, 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 you know, the faculty member for assaulting other students on campus, but they did just the opposite. They, they actually blamed um, the students who were on campus because they upset the professor, which is completely ridiculous. And what is also absurd is that, you know, we're at an, an, we're, we're, we have an environment now or an atmosphere now where we actually have leftist, you know, Bernie campaign uh, workers resorting to trying to shoot, you know, Republican congressmen. That's how bad it's gotten. And sadly, rarely do you hear, you know, prominent leaders of the left denouncing a lot of these attacks. Um, they just kind of blow it off. I mean, specifically regarding, you know, conservative activity on college campuses, rarely do you hear people like Bill Maher say something like, you know, we may disagree with, you know, conservative ideas, but they should at least be allowed to, you know, host their events, bring in their speakers, and talk about their ideas. But that doesn't happen at all. And so, um, unfortunately, um, to really sort of further hammer home how uh, on, co on college and high school campuses, how administrators work to impede conservative activity. One example I always like to point out and feature is something that we call um, the liberal speaker parade. And this is something that uh, you'll encounter maybe at your high schools, um, but certainly when you get to your college campuses. So what is the, the liberal... <laughs> What is the liberal speaker parade? Well, basically, it entails something along the lines of, uh, let's look at a case like Boise State University. This is a school that over a six-year period spent $300,000 of student and taxpayer money on liberal speakers, but on that, during that same time period spent $0 um, on conservatives. At the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, um, this school uh, spent over seven years $180,000 on liberal speakers, and again, zero dollars on conservatives. At uh, Lehigh University in Pennsylvania, this school spent $140,000 on liberal speakers and only $15,000 on conservatives over four years. And finally, at Emory University, this school brought in 35 liberal speakers to only five conservatives. And what's interesting about the uh, Lehigh University example in Emory is that, yes, uh, these schools did have some conservative speakers appear on campus, but they were all hosted through the conservative student club on campus. They weren't brought in by some dean or, like, the student activities committee or the distinguished lecture committee. Not at all. They were all brought in by students like you working with Young America's Foundation trying to make a difference on campus. But if it, was, if it wasn't for these students being active, the imbalance would be even greater. But what is worse than just examples like the liberal speaker parade are when uh, liberal administrators go out of their way to stop students like you from just trying to organize uh, campus events and programs. Now, there's a number of examples I could cite, and there's stuff that goes on virtually every single day in this country. But one example I would like to f uh, focus on is one that occurred at uh, California State University, Los Angeles, uh, last February. Um, and this is a school that prior to this one event, or this one example, 
um, had zero conservative activity prior to last school year. Uh, we are working with a student by the name of Mark Handing. Um, he was a student. He is a student at California State University, Los Angeles, and he wanted to start a Young Americans for Freedom chapter. And our and our team, we got together with him. We helped him get his YAF chapter up and running pretty quickly. Now, uh, once we got his chapter set up, Mark really wanted to draw attention that the, that his club was in fact existed, and he wanted to bring more attention towards his club, and he wanted to, you know, build up his, his membership. And so he decided that he really wanted to host Ben Shapiro to speak at his school, and we were happy to help Mark do that. So we booked Ben Shapiro to speak. We helped pay for a majority of the cost, and we got the event set up. And I think when we started this process, when Mark began this process, I think little did he know the impact that his event would have um, on his campus and the fact that he would arguably get, you know, garner the attention of the entire nation with his one program. Now, once we got Ben Shapiro scheduled, uh, Mark was not about to promote his event uh, using pale pastels. He wanted to use bold colors, to paraphrase uh, Ronald Reagan. And so what he did was he worked with uh, Young America's Foundation uh, to develop uh, this flyer to advertise his event. It's called uh, when diversity becomes a problem. And he worked with our team and got together with my colleague Amy, and they went out on campus, and basically they flyered the entire campus. Um, and when we talk about flyering campus, this is what you want to do. When we say flyering, you don't just put up one or two flyers on the bulletin board. You want to plaster that thing if you can. Um, and they used every means possible to get the word out about their program. So, yes, they used flyers. They had billboards that they wore. They did chalking. They did everything that they could uh, to get the message out that Ben Shapiro was speaking on campus. Now, once the word got out that Ben was going to appear, uh, I mean, the left on campus just went nuts. I mean, they just could not handle the fact that, oh, my gosh, here comes a single conservative speaker to talk about conservative ideas through this Young Americans for Freedom chapter. And so people started talking about Ben and his ideas like, like a month before the lecture, and the left was just outraged. And this outrage, of course, spread to social media. It got so bad that we actually had a professor who threatened Mark and his chapter members on Facebook that he would wrestle them, which was odd. Um, <laughs> and then Mark and his chapter members were also compared to Hitler, and they were called uh, white supremacists. Um, the outrage got so intense that the president of the school got involved, William Cavino. And five days or so before the lecture, the president of the school emailed Mark and said that they were going to cancel the lecture and bring Ben back at a time when they could have a balanced program with another, another liberal speaker, which is just ridiculous. Again, this is a school that has never had any conservative activity in recent memory. They have a number of liberal speakers coming in, and at not one of those programs did they ever think to have, oh, we should actually have the conservative viewpoint at this event. But it was only when the Yaffers were bringing in Ben Shapiro that they felt they had to cancel it and have it to be balanced at, at some later point. And so we talked with Mark and we talked with uh, Ben Shapiro and we said, no way, we're not letting the school cancel this event. We are going to proceed with it regardless of what they want to do. So if we can get into the lecture hall at the scheduled time and date, we would do that. If that's not available, we would be on the, uh, in the student union and speak there. If we can't be in the student union, we would speak on a quad. We didn't care. We were going to the campus, and we made that known uh, to the community and to um, the administration at that school. Now, while we were pressing out these plans, there was another liberal professor on campus who was simply determined to not allow uh, Ben speak at on, on campus. And so she began to drum up uh, protesters from around the city to come in on the day of the event. Now, on the day of the event, uh, when the president saw that we were coming regardless of what he wanted to do, um, he actually sent out a statement saying, yes, we will allow Ben Shapiro to speak on campus. But in his statement, he went out of his way to say that he actually disagreed with everything Ben Shapiro believes in which is completely ridiculous because this is a guy, the president of the school, that actually should be representing all students, not just all liberal students, but all students on that campus. And the fact that he went out of his way to attack conservatives is not, is not right. I mean, any conservative student who was at that school would immediately feel unwelcome by what the president said um, in his statement. And so um, we got to the event, and uh, our club members were there. 
Um, Amy Lutz was there and Andre Zaborda, who's in the back. Um, they went and they were basically greeted by a mob of protesters. It almost turned into a riot. People were being pushed and shoved. Uh, the protesters were linking arms, not letting people actually enter the, the, the room uh, to hear Ben Shapiro speak. The protesters got so bad um, that we actually had to sneak students in through back hallways and doors five at a time just to hear Ben Shapiro's remarks. Um, and unfortunately, hundreds of students were turned away. Now, thankfully, we had a live stream crew there that actually we were able to broadcast Ben's remarks, and it's been seen by over a million people. But it's sad that, you know, um, the, the, the protest got so bad, it almost became a riot, and we had to have uh, a police escort to get Ben Shapiro off campus, and all the students that actually made it into the hallway um, were trapped there for 30 minutes after he left. Now, leading up to the event, you know, with all this stuff going on, I wouldn't have blamed Mark or his chapter members if they were just like, all right, that's enough. Like, we've had it. Um, we're just going back to being, like, average students and just going to class. But, you know, thankfully they didn't give in. They persevered. Their event ended up being headline news on Megyn Kelly. It was featured on Fox Business throughout the day. It was headline news on, on Fox as well in general and captured and it was reported on by a number of other media outlets. Um, and because of their tenacity and pushing forward and sticking with the event, you know, afterwards there was a lot of other conservative students at this school who actually saw the bravery that Mark and his chapter had and came out and joined his club in droves. His chapter is now one of the largest chapters um, in, the United, in the entire country. What's even better is that, you know, following the protest, following this one event, they just didn't sit back and just say, hey, that's our one event, we're done for the semester. They kept staying active. They organized more events. Like, they also were managed to sneak in to a meeting between the president of the school and other leftist faculty members and students afterwards where they videotaped the president saying that he would never invite Ben Shapiro to speak on campus and he would not have other conservative speakers there. They sent us the videotape and we got that out um, to all the media. They also brought in five more conservative speakers just this school year. So their chapter has really made a huge impact um, on that campus. And um, it's really great to see that they have done so by not moderating their ideas. They've been bold conservatives. This is a campus that is basically more than 60% Hispanic and only 7% Caucasian. And I think it underscores the point that if we, again, are bold and we present our ideas effectively and boldly on campus, we don't have to moderate them, but students will um, come and turn out to our ideas. So I think it's a good lesson to keep in mind. Now, beyond that, though, I think what all these examples uh, underscore as far as the attacks, the attacks on free speech and the protests and whatnot and the administrators trying to stop you to speak, trying to stop your events from happening and so on, but I think they underscore you know, how determined the left is to maintain their monopoly and to keep their core concepts from being challenged. I mean, obviously, they say they're for you know, diversity and education and balance, but they're really not. They're just for intimidation and indoctrination. And despite the fact that the left controls you know, higher education, most of your high schools, uh, the movie industry, the music industry, the gaming industry, like video games and whatnot. You know, it's sad but that there are students and leftist students at your high schools and other administrators who somehow feel threatened by the fact that there are students like you who just want to talk about conservative ideas. I mean, some colleges, the atmosphere is so bad that just the mere presence of a conservative on campus is kind of like a microaggression or something like that. Um, and that's how silly it's gotten. And I always felt the response to uh, conservative activity, to what you all are trying to do at your high schools, I always felt the leftists should respond by saying, you know, go ahead, start your one conservative club, bring in your one conservative speaker. We know that our ideas, leftist ideas, can withstand anything you have to offer. But that's not how they respond, obviously. They try and shut you down with intimidation, bureaucratic maneuvers, and dirty tricks and whatnot. And these tactics that they use at your high schools and on your college campuses to intimidate you, that's not just limited to your campuses. They are, these same tactics are then used on a national level. It's almost like college campuses are like training grounds for leftist, leftist activists and then go out and use it 
on a national level against Trump or whoever else. And even though generally there have been times historically that it has appeared that the left has seemingly been defeated with, through elections and initiatives and whatnot, you know, it's important to keep in mind that they never stop advocating for their ideas. They always keep pressing forward, regardless of how bad they've been defeated or how often they've been defeated. Let me just share with you a couple examples. After the 2000 and 2004 presidential elections, for example, when George W. Bush won, the left could have just given up. They could have said, we can't beat uh, uh, President Bush. We're going to pack it in and go do something else, whatever. Well, they didn't. They relentlessly attacked our ideas. They relentlessly attacked our leaders. And it was because of their relentless attacks that they were able to convince the American people that conservative ideas were somehow hurtful to our country, and we ended up with President Barack Obama, basically. Now, let's look at, at the 2010 uh, midterms. Uh, President Obama had a big loss during those midterms. And there was a lot of individuals, a lot of leaders in the conservative movement who came away from those midterm elections after this huge victory for conservatives who said, you know, there is no way, no way Barack Obama could win two years later. Well, obviously, that didn't happen. And at no time during his presidency, in my view, did President Obama ever, like, moderate his opinions or did he ever, like, get together with conservative leaders and consider conservative ideas. It never happened, no matter, no matter how often he, defeat, he was defeated um, in the midterms or legislatively. Also, let's look at the last election, the one that just happened, presidential election. You know, if you think back to October, I think it was October or so, if you all remember the, 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 the uproar that was coming from the left and the media when Trump kind of hinted or didn't answer the question as to whether he would accept the election results. Remember, like, people were flipping out, like, how dare he? It was an endless discussion on CNN and Fox News and whatever. Yet, when Trump actually wins, what happens from them? They freak out, right? They riot. They blame the loss on Russian interference. Um, they don't actually blame themselves for the loss or their ideas. Um, you have Democrats, uh, and, you know, boycotting the inaugural. People like Chuck Schumer never say anything like, we need to come together for unity or come together for the country. They say nothing along those lines. Um, and they keep pressing forward with their hateful rhetoric. rhetoric. Um, and so, you know, they have not once offered basically a conciliatory message. And I think we as conservatives need to remember this moving forward. Um, this is how the left operates. I know it's easy for us after a huge victory to think, hey, we won. We can just go chill out and pack it, pack it in for a little bit. We can't do that because the left never stops fighting. We always need to remember that. So if you want to be a successful leader in your life, if you want to be like in Congress or run for public office at some time during your career, I would really encourage you right now to start developing your leadership skills and what we like to call your activist mentality. Because I guarantee you, at your high schools, there were administrators, other liberal students, and even when you get to college campus, who are out there ready and excited, I think, unfortunately, to stop you from what you're trying to do. They're trying to undermine conservative activity. Again, we see it happen all the time at CSULA and campuses around the country where students, liberal students, are protesting liberal uh, conservative events, rather. But, you know, unfortunately, rarely do we as conservatives do this, right? We need to be going to events featuring, you know, liberal speakers and asking tough questions. We shouldn't be as disruptive as they are, but we should be there in the, at the event challenging their ideas in some form. Or, if you want to try it this way, you can go to events featuring liberal speakers, pose as a liberal student, and ask like, a really crazy question to make the speaker seem even more liberal than they are and make them, like, make them embarrass themselves and uh, film it and put it up on social media. That's a lot of fun if you can pull it off. But anyhow, uh, <laughs> try it. Uh, anyhow, but you have to do this. You have to confront the other side. Because what you need to remember is that you may not represent the majority of, of opinion at your high schools or when you get to your college campus, but you do, in my opinion, represent the majority of opinion in society at large. And essentially, you need to see your role as reminding the campus community that there is like a real world outside the camp campus bubble that thinks that the campus value system is ludicrous. You kind of need to see yourselves as like the sane ones in the asylum. And don't forget, there are a lot of like just average moderate, undecided students who are at your school who can be swayed in your direction if they see that the left does not totally dominate the campus debate. However, if the current freshman class goes through, at your high schools, goes through the next four years without ever hearing any conservative ideas, they can become 
basically uh, liberal by osmosis. So I know some of you in here are already active in YAF chapters or active in other ways at your high schools. Uh, but for, for those of you who are not, and if you want to, if you step up now, I know you can have a tremendous impact. But the key to your success and being successful as an activist at your high schools and on your college campuses is by boldly promoting conservative ideas. Your goal when you're being an activist at your, at your schools is not to get along with the other side, and God forbid you don't want to try to ever appease them. Your goal is to boldly promote conservatism as much as possible. And sadly, during my time, though, at Young America's Foundation, what I've noticed is that our activists, our student leaders, I think, tend to follow one of two approaches when they kind of proceed with their campus activism. On the one hand, there are students who follow what I call uh, passive activism. What's that? Kind of sounds like, like an oxymoron or something. Well, basically, these students are active. These are conservative students. They're in a club, a conservative club, at their high schools or on their college campus. But their activities in this club focus exclusively on doing things like having social events, maybe having, like, you know, touch football with the young Democrats or something, um, voter registration drives or whatever. And that's all fine. And, you know, these events can and should be part of what any group does on any given campus. But these events, in and of themselves, do very little to actually promote conservatism to other students on campus. It's kind of like these groups have adopted a live and let live philosophy. In other words, as long as the left never directly attacks or confronts their club, um, the conservatives on campus will leave the left alone. Well, in turn, by doing that, the liberal groups, the liberal administrators get all, all the events, all the programs, all the funding that they want. On the other hand, uh, there are students who follow what I call um, bold activism, and that these students make a point uh, to promote conservatism each week, again, whether that's through flyering, tweeting, blogging, you know, whatever it may be. And it's these students that follow this more bolder style, style of activism that have a much broader impact on their campus than those who follow the passive approach. And I always like to compare these two approaches to campus activism back to how two past Republican presidents dealt with the former Soviet Union. So, on the one hand, you had a president like Richard Nixon. If you guys remember your history with Richard Nixon, his philosophy towards dealing with the Soviet Union was detente, right? He wanted to maintain the status quo. He wanted to get along with the Soviets. Even though they were determined to destroy our way of life, he wanted to get along with them. It was because of this policy that Nixon followed, along with Presidents Ford and Carter, that we slowly saw communism gaining ground and freedom losing ground. Well, on the other hand, of course, like as we learned this weekend, there was a president like Ronald Reagan, right? Ronald Reagan made a point to confront and defeat the Soviets. He called them an evil empire. He challenged Gorbachev to tear down the Berlin Wall. And it was because of Ronald Reagan's bold uh, approach to dealing the, with the Soviet Union that President Reagan, in my view, is rightly credited with ending the Cold War. Well, what you want to do is take President Reagan's approach to, you know, confronting and defeating the Soviet Union uh, worldwide to taking that same style and applying it on your high school campus, right? You want to be bold and aggressive um, in promoting conservatism um, at your school. Now, to do this, actually, to put it into practice, what you need to do is, you know, if there's not one available, you need to join a conservative club at your high school. Um, Young America's Foundation will work with any student, any conservative organization that may exist on any high school or college campus. However, if you find you do not have any existing conservative chapters or clubs at your high school, um, I would encourage you to start a Young Americans for Freedom chapter. Um, we all have been learning about you know, Ronald Reagan this weekend. Ronald Reagan got involved with Young Americans for Freedom in 1962. He joined our advisory board uh, and was a national chairman uh, throughout his career. I know a number of you in here are already yaffers, uh, but if you would like to join or potentially are interested in starting a YAF chapter, we do have an interest form um, at every one of your seats, and you can just fill those out, turn them in, and it doesn't lock you in. It just says, hey, I'm interested. Send me more information, and we'll be glad to get that to you. But having a club regardless is very important 
Because if you want to make a difference at your school, it gives you a vehicle to attract like-minded students. And if you want to bring in speakers, we can help you bring a number of big-name conservative speakers to your high schools. Uh, we just had recently Dinesh D'Souza speak to a full school assembly in Texas, right, uh, in Canyon High School. So we'd love to make that happen at your schools. But you need a club to organize the event. So try and have one available. If you know, We can help you start one if there's not one already there. Now, once you get your club set up, one of the basic problems that every group face, whether they're in high school or whether they're on, on a college campus, is really trying to figure out how do they build their membership and how do they maintain interest in, in their organizations, right? How, they, how do they build buzz for themselves? Well, following the Reagan style of activism will help you solve this problem because you know, maintaining interest and building membership in your club, in my view, really boils down to how often do other students at your schools actually see you and your club actually out there physically like doing things? Like, yes, it's important to have social media. You want to have your Twitter account. You want to have your Facebook page you want to have her, and whatever for your club. But you have to have that physical presence. Because if, if other students feel that your club doesn't do anything, why should they waste their time? There are so many other distractions that students can get involved with, you know, besides going to your club meetings. You know, they can just go home and do their homework. You have to make them feel like their time is worth it. So you have to show that your club actually does things, and following the Reagan style will help you solve this problem. So you, but you also have to always work on your physical presence so students can actually see you on campus. For example, uh, a few years ago, we were working with uh, Kellyanne Conway, who our, was our pollster, and we were really trying to figure out, you know, how do we get more students more conservative students specifically, to be active in chapters across this country. We knew how to energize and activate the, the current club memberships and the leaders, but we knew there were so many other conservative students out there that who just weren't getting involved. And we wanted to figure out, well, how do we do that? How do we activate them? And so we had this nationwide poll that we worked with Kellyanne Conway to kind of figure that out and really drill down and decide how do we get these students to come out and join a club. And what we found was pretty interesting, and that was is that you know, despite this being the era of Twitter and Snapchat and Facebook and Tumblr and whatever else, the basic core concepts, the old traditional concepts of reaching out to students, you know, the traditional methods of face-to-face -face contacts is still what matters most. The biggest hesitation from students joining a conservative club at your high schools was whether they were going to be liked. If they didn't know anyone in that club, they were very hesitant to join that organization. So it really is important that you are out there um, on your campus so students can interact with you. 70% um, didn't care if the club was respected by the faculty. They had no, they didn't care if the teachers liked the club or not. And they were very interested in joining a club that focused on issues they care about. But if they didn't know anyone in the club, they were very hesitant to join. So a couple of examples. I was talking, we have a high school student. She just recently graduated from a high school in Ohio. She's active in her YAF chapter in her high school, and she's going to Ohio State. She told me she was thinking about joining the chapter for three months prior to actually joining. And what actually put her over the top was that she was actually able to meet and talk with the chapter leaders um, in her, like, lunchroom when, when they had, like, a little like, recruitment table set up. And so it was that personal interaction that got her over that hump to join the club. Um, Jolie, our conference director, she talks about how she came to our first conference as a communist, right? Well, how did she first find out about our conference? It wasn't on Facebook. It wasn't through the, through the Internet. She basically found out about our conferences because she saw a, a conservative activist at a recruitment table and learned about our conference there. So it was this face-to-face -face interaction that's very important. So you always want to focus on that. Now, so along with maintaining your physical presence, you also want to think about with, your, with all your clubs, I think you basically want to have two basic goals, and some of these are self-evident, but I think that every goal should think through how they can promote conservatism each week. That's the first goal. And you can do this in one of two ways. One, it's very easy. One, you can just go out and attack the left. Um, obviously, at most high schools, they have a lot of initiatives and programs and activities going on. Like, you can go to, like, you know, sometimes they'll have, like, an Earth Day fair or an environmental fair, and you can get your club members together and scream obnoxious slogans like, burn the rainforest and shoot the manatees and things like that, and <laughs> watch liberal minds explode, and, you know, that'd probably be a lot of fun, and you'd probably have a lot of laughs, but you probably actually won't bring a lot of people to our side. 
So I'm not actually encouraging you to do that. Um, although it would be fun. Um, but, you know, if, honestly, if all you do is just go out and attack the other side, um, you'll lose. When you think back to President Reagan and what he did during his presidency, he didn't just attack every left-wing program. Um, what he did when he did attack the other side or the Soviets was he identified their greatest weakness. So with the Soviets, he identified the Berlin Wall as their greatest weakness and exploited it. So why was their system so great? They had to keep a wall from people from leaving, right? So you want to do the same thing if you attack the other side at your school uh, as far as analyzing their programs. But it's much more important, I think, that you develop your own programs, your own initiatives, and we can help you with this, and I'll give you some examples that you can organize, that you can organize, rather, that forces the left to respond to you. And when they do that, you know you're being successful. But focusing on your weekly goal brings you to your organizational goal, and this should be obvious, right? Like, you want your conservative club at your high schools to be seen as the most prominent group in the area, the most prominent conservative club, period. You want to get to the point that whenever a teacher, the faculty, the principal, or even most importantly, a local newspaper reporter, you know, you, when they sit back and think, hey, I need the young conservative viewpoint for this story I'm working on, you know, bam, you want that reporter to automatically think of you and your organization. But the only way you get to that point of being seen as the representative of, like, young conservatism in your area is by focusing on your weekly goal of always being out there, building your presence, organizing events, and showing that you can be successful in organizing a good program. Now, when I say you want to organize events each week, though, I'm not suggesting you have to go out and organize protests all the time and yell at people and scream at people. That's totally not necessary. There are some small, simple activities that you can do to really kind of just build your initial club presence, right? So first thing, one, you can just go out, uh, if you can get a permission, and just set up a recruitment table. It's very, something very easy to do. Um, one thing I would make sure is that your recruitment tables actually are um, appealing to people. Um, this is a, uh, a, a club fair that I was at at a local high school in Fairfax, Virginia. And this is probably the most pathetic uh, recruitment table I've ever seen in my life. Um, it's basically for the school's angler club. Um, the student's not paying attention to people around the table. He's just stuffing his face with food. Um, there's nothing on the table that's attractive. Like, they just have these shrink-wrapped muffins that look disgusting. Like, why would you go up and talk to them, right? So you just want to make sure that you have tables that have a lot of interesting things on them. And so Young America's Foundation, we help you with this stuff to make your YAF chapters have a lot of fun swag, if you will, to give out to students. So we can provide that to you. Also, don't underestimate, again, small, simple activities. I know, like, flyers seem like, oh, it's so antiquated or whatever. But, again, it's these small, simple activities that will help your members get involved with your club and make them, make them feel like you really need their help, right? And also remember that we as conservatives, you know, we're not natural activists. And so it's going to be rare when you have members coming to your club who are going to be, like, energized and excited to get up on the proverbial soapbox and just start screaming at people, right, or having protests. It doesn't happen very often. There are exceptions, but it doesn't happen. So typically you have to bring people along slowly um, with, like, more simpler activities uh, to get them involved. So, like, handing up a flyer is something easy that most people um, can do. And before you start any initiative at your high schools with your clubs or when you get to your college campus, um, the first thing you should ask yourselves, whether you're bringing a speaker, setting up a petition, whatever, it could be anything. The first thing you want to ask is, do other students at my high school actually care about the chosen issue we want to work on? We, sometimes what we get stuck in is, you know, we as conservatives, we want to talk about issues that we care about, but these are issues, there may be issues that other students could care less. So, for example, taxes is a good issue. Um, you know, we think taxes should be as low as possible. That's very important. However, a lot of students don't work, and they don't pay a lot of taxes. So sometimes if you just bring a speaker straight in on talking about taxes, you're not going to have a lot of people there. So you always have to think through what are the issues that students care about. Similarly, you also should think through whether you're using the right phrases in marketing. That can be important. This takes time to master sometimes. But, you know, some of you are going to be operating in some of the most liberal environments imaginable. And often, if you use the wrong phrases or the wrong terms to define what you consider conservatism, 
that can make your job much more difficult than it needs to be. So I mentioned the other poll that we have with Kellyanne. We also did a poll with her on a few years ago trying to figure out what are students' viewpoints on the free market and what are students' views on the government intervention in the economy. And the good news from this um, poll was that students do not want more government involvement um, in, in the marketplace, which is great. But students uh, around the country had very specific viewpoints on terms that we use in the conservative movement to talk about the free market and capitalism and so on. So I want to talk about uh, some of those and kind of highlight why this is important. So I want to talk about capitalism, free market, and entrepreneurship, okay? So capitalism only had a 33% favorability rating among students. Uh, so it wasn't very high. It was a pretty negative view towards, towards capitalism. Free market was a little better. It was at 44% um, favorable. But the best was entrepreneurship. 66% of students had a favorable viewpoint on the term entrepreneurship. So if you were going to organize events on your campus uh, based around the free market or whatever, obviously you would want to try and skew more towards entrepreneurship or the free market and avoid terms like capitalism. Same thing when you're marketing your events. You don't want to say your speakers are controversial. The only conservative ideas are not inherently controversial. They're only controversial to the left. They're the ones that want to stop us from speaking and not you know, having our viewpoints get out. So you don't want to say that our speakers are controversial. They're not. They're impactful. They're exciting. They're provocative, potentially. But they're not controversial. Only the left considers them controversial. And I would argue, add just that we have a lot of resources that we can give you, again, whether you're involved in a YAF chapter or not, to help you um, succeed at your high schools. Real quickly, I want to walk through um, a few specific activities that you can organize at all of your high schools uh, this fall semester. Um, the first is the 9-11 uh, Never Forget Project. Um, this is a program that we began in 2003 when we noticed as we were leading up to the second anniversary of 9-11, most colleges and high schools were completely ignoring the anniversary. Here it was, the most impactful event in recent American history, and most schools were pretty much ignoring the entire day. So we established the 9-11 Never Forget Project to help you guys encourage your school to properly remember the day. And basically, it consists of 3,000 American flags to represent each person killed in the terrorist attacks. And you can set this up in your campus quad, um, in a field, near a football game arena, wherever you want. You can set this up on any college or high school campus. And we have flags that we can help provide to you, and it's a real great uh, activity to organize, and it's a great reminder of how our country was impacted on that day. So that's September. Let's look at, at uh, October. Who is this guy? All right. So you guys may know who Che Guevara is, but a lot of your classmates have no idea. They may sometimes see his uh, uh, people wearing his T-shirts. There's a movie out there called The Motorcycle Diaries where they just portray him as some nice, quiet poet who rides around on a motorcycle, obviously. But that's not who he was at all. Basically, he was a murderer. He murdered his friends who didn't reject you know, democratic ideals. He helped with the violent overthrow of the Cuban regime. Uh, he murdered children in his guerrilla camps who were simply accused of, of uh, stealing food. And he is quoted as saying that the solution to the world's problems can be found behind the Iron Curtain, the same Iron Curtain that murdered over 100 million people. And so what we did was we felt we should develop a day to help you guys educate other students on who he truly was. So we decided to take October 9th, the day he was executed in Bolivia, um, and have something that we call uh, No More Che Day. And so we have a lot of posters and materials that we can give to you for free. Um, we have this Victims of Che Guevara poster that is actually a photo mosaic. You might be able to tell what it is, but it's actually an image made up of, of individuals who were all murdered by Che and the Cuban regime. And again, it's a really strong visual graphic of, of who he truly was. And we also have other materials we can send you. Lastly, in November, uh, I'll end up with this, it's Freedom Week. Um, when you get to college especially, you'll notice that le liberal groups like to have a lot of like themed weeks, like coming out week and whatever else. And so what we decided to do was to have a week where you guys can promote conservative ideas. And Freedom Week celebrates two things. Um, the November 9th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall and Veterans Day. And it's a great way for you guys to have a lot of themed activities around you know, anniversaries and events that you care about. 
And as far as, you know, the Berlin Wall, the idea is not just to simply remember the anniversary. What students do is they build a mock Berlin Wall on campus, and then they have fun tearing it down. Uh, Grant Strobel, what he did one year on the bottom right was they, you know, spray painted like safe space and all of those terms on his wall, and they had students smashing those, that, those terms out of existence on campus, which was fun. So you can play with it and have a lot of fun with it, but it's also a reminder to underscore to students that, you know, these, uh, you know, progressive, uh, communist, socialist ideas have failed, and why do we have people, uh, some in our government, but some people on, at our high schools and on college campuses who think we should adopt these same viewpoints. And lastly, we would love to help you bring a prominent conservative speaker to every single one of your high schools. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's probably the one activity that gets you to get your whole student body together and hear from a prominent conservative on campus. And the best thing about bringing in a conservative speaker uh, to your high schools or your college campuses is the drama or the live interaction that occurs uh, during the event. Like, there is nothing better, for example, than like during the Q&A session and some like, like ignorant liberal student gets up to ask uh, a tough question to like Ben Shapiro and he tears down their arguments in front of the whole student body. Like it is just awesome. Like it is something you have to see at some point during your time in high school or college. So I just want to conclude that really now is the time to be an activist. You don't want to wait until after you graduate because after you graduate like college, like you're going to be faced with the three M's, mortgage, marriage, and munchkins. And all these things are going to take time away from you doing what you like to do. So you always want to, now is the best time to be an activist and to talk, you know, start working on promoting conservatism. And you can have a huge impact. Even the smallest bit of activism can really change your campus, whether it's at your high school or, or your college campus. And I have proof. I want to read with you real quickly this email that I have here. This is an email from a bunch of liberal students right up here at UC Santa Barbara. And we had some conservative students get on their listserv, so they were spying on everything they were saying, okay? And so this is a, an, a, an email that was sent from a liberal activist to his other liberal buddies. And before I read this, let me just preface it by saying that the only thing that had gone on on that campus as far as conservative activity was that this, um, uh, the, the conservative club at UC Santa Barbara had brought in Oliver North. Now, give me a break. Like... UCSB, again, is one of the most left-wing colleges in the country. There was liberal events going on every single day at that school. Yet the fact that the conservative club at that school can bring in two speakers, like two, and they're like flipping out about it. So I hope you take advantage of it, and I thank you guys for being here. <laughs>